Elizabeth, it's such a thrill to be, well, for me to be back with New Hope and to worship with you all, to be singing with you all is just so exciting. Um, one of, thank you, <laughs> Lynn, one of our most present promises that I'm claiming at the moment is found in Isaiah uh, 41 and verse 10, which says, fear thee not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So no matter what the battle you may be going through this morning or you have gone through this week, remember victory comes through Jesus. So I'd like to invite you to stand with us and sing our very first song, Victory in Jesus. And let's sing it like we really mean it. Stand with us, please. to that. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself woke up every morning early and went to a quiet place. How much more do we need to spend that time alone with God the first thing in the morning to be able to renew ourselves every day? Let's um, sing our next song, In the Garden.
make that commitment to spend that time with the Lord as we go into a new week. Um, what did we, what did the world around celebrate this past week? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Well, it's an official, it's an official holiday in America, but I know some Australians have celebrated it too. Um, turn to the person next to you and tell them one thing <clears throat> that you're thankful for. And then, after Thanksgiving, yesterday was a huge sale day, wasn't it? Black Friday. And people make themselves happy by just thinking that they can go and get all these wonderful things, stuff, to make them happy. But true happiness comes from the Lord. Let's sing our next song. Happiness is the Lord. sounded so good too and there's a good crowd here for sabbath school praise the lord i'm glad to see you happy sabbath and i'm going to encourage what we're going to try and do i'm not going to do it today but we're going to try from each week we don't want people up in the wings for sabbath school we want them down here but i'm glad you're here you know i don't know where i don't think i told you this and i think it was this week on monday i took my big yellow dog you know the dog i'm talking about not lucky roger the devil dog i call him i take him for a walk with liska and we're walking along and he sees another dog now i don't know what is in the brains of these american staffordshire bull terriers they're all the same and he sees this other dog and you know what he does he whips around behind me this way he pulled my now i'm not a light man but this is a big dog and he pulled my legs out from underneath me i fell flat on the ground hurt my knees there's a little earthquake out there at marsden park <laughs> and this dog of mine 50 plus kilograms took off 200 meters chasing this man and his dog now what do you think the man thought horrifying he must have thought it was the end of the world. And I don't usually run, and I don't think Liz could see me run faster than I did. I was up in the ground, from the ground in about one second, and I was after this dog of mine. He got to the dog, and what do you think he did? Full on attack. Full on attack. 
But he made a mistake. He's only 18 months old. This was a full-grown blue healer. And they know how to fight. And by the time I got to him about 20 seconds later, I reckon I went close to the Olympic qualifying time over 200 metres. Um, my dog was bleeding profusely. And I think if the fight had gone on, and it might have been good for Raj, he would have copped a bit of a hiding. It was so embarrassing. And I grabbed my dog and I tried to pull him off. Very, very difficult. Eventually I got him off and I'm apologising profusely to this poor neighbour of mine. I don't think he'll ever talk to me again. And, and he, he walked off with his dog, his dog in one piece. My, my dog had blood all over me. You know, I just sat there on the ground for five minutes, shaking. And then I got to thinking later on in the week, I wonder if that's how God feels when we do stupid things. I am Raj's protector, true? I'm the one who intervenes and looks after him when things are going wrong. And I wonder if we shake God up too sometimes. I think we do, what do you reckon? But he never, ever stops walking and protecting us. And I'm so glad of that. And the reason I'll tell you that little story, however you've come to church this morning, whether you need protecting and you've been doing some dumb things this week, or whether you're here on fire for God, we're glad to have you. Amen? This is our first Sabbath officially in our new church. And it warms my heart to see a few more at Sabbath school here today than normal. Good on yous. I'm going to actually get you guys to come and sit down here so you can see. But sit in the middle so you can see. And I want to welcome our speaker to the front. Um, do you like our new church? Yeah. Hey, do you like our new church? Yeah. It's beautiful. Ah, okay, we're going to move this a little. It's beautiful, isn't it? We have a very special guest speaker, and I want to welcome him to the front. And I don't want to, uh, uh, I'm going to say a prayer, and well, I might even let him pray before he preaches. Um, his name is Pastor Adam Ramden. He broke his leg. He was due to be here a few weeks ago, a few months ago, actually, when we were here trialing this place. And he broke his leg. Uh, uh, I'll let you tell him, welcome, Pastor. And you're, all, you're walking still a little bit gingerly. Just tell us quickly, how did you break your leg? I had a jet ski accident. Good old youth ministry. So you are a youth pastor, youth leader? What's, tell us a little. Youth director uh, for the North England Conference in England. And I was at the campsite in Wales. And I was out on a, on a rough sea. Probably shouldn't have been out. And one thing led to another. He thinks, uh, he thinks the jet ski went up in the air. Mate, how far in the air were you? And it come back down and landed on his leg. Broke your... Broke my fibula just there. So it wasn't too bad a break. Luckily, it wasn't the ankle or the, or the tibula. But um, still, it's a bit inconvenient. Now, just very quickly, you're married? Yes, married five years ago. Children? One on the way. So next time you come out, you'll bring that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Now, look, we're going to talk to you a little bit more on church, so I don't want to take too much time now. I'll get you to pray as, as you begin your presentation. This is live, the guy from Lineage. Aren't we glad to have him here? Yeah. We've been watching you for, oh, a long time now, and we've really enjoyed those Lineage videos, and they've blessed us so much, and we thank you for it. We want to thank you for coming out here. He's come from England for one Sabbath. One Sabbath. He's here for three programs today, 11 o'clock, 11.15 and 2 o'clock. And then tomorrow at 11, 1 o'clock, he flies out of here back to England. So we're really grateful. I know you're paying a price for this. Yeah. But we're really grateful to have you here. A big warm Aussie welcome. We'll feed you well, mate. And uh, I know you'll feed us through the Holy Spirit well too. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here in Australia and to have the privilege to worship with you here at the New Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I understand it's your first official Sabbath in, the, in this new location, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. Let's bow our heads as we begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you for bringing us through this week and for life, health, and strength today. As we open your word today, and in particular at this time, speak through it and speak through me, I pray in Christ's name, amen. 
Well, this morning and this morning and this afternoon, we're going to have three different messages, and they're all going to kind of be focused around one of the big questions in life. They say there's three big questions in life. One of them is, where am I going? Another one is, why am I here? And a third question is, where do I... Anyone know? Where do I come from? Where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And, and when we did this video series called Lineage, the, the inspiration behind it was to provide a video resource. Initially, it was primarily for young people, but we realized the catchment has far exceeded just the young demographic. But it was to provide a video resource that would answer the question for us as Christians, as Adventists today, where do we come from? What's our spiritual lineage? And so today, this morning, this morning, and this afternoon, I'm going to do three different presentations exploring a little bit this theme and looking at what are some of the lessons from the past and what are some of the um, things that our spiritual forefathers stood on. So this presentation, this one, we're going to be looking a little bit at the man you can see there at the top, Martin Luther. This picture was taken about two years ago now. Uh, we were filming in Wittenberg in winter. Now, if you have seen Lineage, you'll notice that some of the episodes are filmed in winter when it was cold. And if we'd planned this thing properly, we would have planned to film in the summer. But God sometimes has different ideas, and it was a bitterly cold day as we were there filming that day. Now, Martin Luther... Before we get to Martin Luther, Isaac Newton, who was a famous Englishman, he said these words, if I have seen further, it is by standing on, and there's that phrase, the what? The shoulders of giants. We have some giants in spiritual history today, Martin Luther being just one of them. And as we live today looking forward into the future, it does well for us, I believe, to see where these men came from, what challenges they had. What, what, what obstacles they had to overcome, and also see what the parallels with our day and age might be today. Martin Luther was born in the late 1400s. He was born into this house here. If you have the opportunity to go to Germany, some of you may have been. It's in Eisleben. I probably slaughtered the German language there. And this is the house he was born in. His father was a miner. The building there at the back that you can see here that is the church that he would have been dedicated, well, christened or baptized, as they would call it back then, in that church. Now, in this home, it's, it's quite a big home, you may say, but he still came from a fairly poor background. Um, there's artifacts inside. I don't think that's his original bed. Some say it's his bedroom. We're not quite sure, but it's definitely not his bed, and that's definitely not an original table. But they've tried to put a few things there as to what it would have looked like. This is the inside of the church today where he would have been uh, baptized as a young infant child. There in the Catholic church, he would be baptized very soon after you were born. And, and so we kind of were able to trace Martin Luther's home and, and go to these different places. Now, as Martin Luther got older, I'm going over broad swaths of history. As he got older, he had a desire to become a monk. And today you can go to the city of Erfurt. Again, I'm probably slaughtering the German language. And there in the city, you can go to the monastery where he studied. They've turned some of it into, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a hotel, but you can rent the rooms out there and you can spend the night there. We didn't have the opportunity to spend the night there. It was fully booked, but we went there anyway to visit this place. And there there's rooms and they've kind of created it. It used to obviously be a Catholic. Today it's owned by the Lutherans. And, and you can go down a memory lane with Martin Luther. They believe that he was living in probably the top right room on the second floor. And so we filmed a little bit under his window. And that's where he would have lived. Now, it was while he was living there and studying there in Erfurt that he, he was grappling with what is the gospel. What is the gospel? As an Adventist church today, do we have this same struggle, yes or no? We have the same struggle. And he was there on, trying to study, trying to learn, and trying to find out what does it mean how we are saved. He had this quotation there, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it would be who? It would be I. And there's p Christians like this today. If ever there was a Christian, and some of you may be them or some of you may know them, that would get to heaven by doing such and such, maybe it was us, maybe it's us in a previous life, or maybe it's someone that we, can, that we know, but uh, Martin Luther was going through this same struggle. If ever there was someone that got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. 
He had quite a legalistic, quite a works-based religion, but the Lord would lead him to different people. One of the things that he would be led to was in this building here. It's quite amazing to go to this building. This is the church or the chapel in the monastery. And you can read about this in the book, Great Controversy. Ellen White writes, and many historians write that it was in this room somewhere. We're not quite sure where. Was it the left? Was it the right? Was it the far side? Where Martin Luther found a book. And the book was encased in some metal, I believe. And there was a chain attached to the book. It seems so strange to us today. We come to church and maybe you brought a hard copy of your Bible or maybe you have an electronic copy. I don't know. But Martin Luther, back then, there was no Bibles. He's studying to be a monk. He's studying to be a pastor. And there he's never seen or touched or read a Bible. And it was in this room here where he's there in, in this room. He finds this book. It's in Latin. He finds this book chained to the wall. And he spent a lot of his time there going to read this Bible and trying to study it and decipher what's God's will for his life. And what, what does the Bible have to say for him today? And so in this room, he started to peel back the layers of darkness as he read the Bible. Maybe not as pure as the Bible we have today is, but still the Bible better than nothing. He started to read it in the Latin. And, and the Lord also brought into his path another man called Dr. Staupitz. Dr. Staupitz was a, was, was a friend of his. He was a, a scholar there. And he helped Martin Luther considerably in his understanding as to what the gospel is. That we're not saved by our monkery, we're not saved by our works, and he started to introduce to him the idea that we're saved by our faith and grace from Jesus Christ. So Dr. Staupitz helped him out considerably. He said, if it were not for Dr. Staupitz, I would have sunk into hell. And maybe some of you here today, you know someone in your spiritual walk, maybe it was a pastor, a parent, an elder, or a Sabbath school teacher that helped you on your spiritual journey because you were kind of going into darkness spiritually. And the Lord sends people, and if you have a clear understanding of what the gospel is, then maybe you are such a person for someone else. Martin Luther graduated from, the, from there in Erfurt, and he went off to Wittenberg. And while he was there in Wittenberg, there was a dispute that arose amongst some of the churches in the area. And they decided that somebody needed to go to Rome to settle the dispute. Providentially, I believe it was, Martin Luther was chosen to be the one that would go to Rome to settle the dispute that was there in his area. And so he made his pilgrimage to Rome. And you can imagine for him, this was the journey of a lifetime. He's never been to Rome before. He's heard about Rome and he's always wanted to be there. Today, there may be similar quote-unquote pilgrimages that people may go on. For some people, it's as a Christian going to the Holy Land or seeing the city of Jerusalem. For Martin Luther and for the Catholic Church back then, going to Rome was that was it. He writes in his biography how when he got to Rome, as he got over the hill uh, the, the, where he first saw Rome, he lay prostrate on the ground and he said, holy city of Rome, I salute thee. But his hubris would turn to nemesis as he walked through the streets of Rome. And he later re recounted that he saw every type of sin and evil being practiced in Rome. He's quoted as saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. There's another phrase, it wasn't from him, but other people say that faith was born in Rome, but practiced elsewhere. And there in Rome, there was so much whatever going on amongst the clergy, amongst the priests, amongst the bishops, that they weren't even reflecting the gospel that they were spreading to the world. And as he got there and started to see that the city he'd dreamed of going to wasn't really what he thought, it disappointed him. But he was still a faithful Catholic. He was still... Now this... He wouldn't have seen this view when he went to Rome because this building wasn't built till after he was there. But nevertheless, I thought I would put it in. It's quite an iconic image, St. Peter's Basilica. This is the inside of St. Peter's Basilica that was paid for from the indulgences that we're going to speak about in just a moment. But there was one place that was definitely there when he was there. And if you ever go to Rome, I would suggest going to this place as being, we, we actually met one time a Roman Catholic bishop and we asked him where this place was. And he said to us, Roman Catholic bishop, he said, this is one of the most authentic places in the whole city of Rome. Why is it the, one of the most authentic places? Because we know that something historical, a turning point of history, took place right on those steps. This here is the 
Pilate staircase outside the St. John's Church. And it was on these stairs. It's called Pilate staircase because the belief is this. The belief is this is the same staircase that Jesus ascended on the day or the night when he was betrayed or when Pilate stood there and said, do you want Barabbas or Jesus? Now, the belief goes this, that miraculously at night, an angel picked the staircase up from Rome and transported it. Sorry, picked the staircase up from Jerusalem and transported it to Rome. Now, don't laugh too much. We believe in miracles too, amen? Though I do believe this one's a bit of a stretch. Anyway, so it's dropped in Rome. So now pilgrims go there, and, and this was taken, I was there one, one year, in the summertime, it was obviously a lot of tourists, and there was basically a traffic jam to get onto the staircase. And when the pilgrims go there today, they go there, they queue up, as you can see people queuing, and they kneel. And they go up every single stair, and they say a prayer on the next first step. Then they go to the next step and say a prayer, next step and say a prayer, next step and say a prayer, next step and say a prayer. Say a prayer. It can take them 15, 20, 30 minutes to get all the way to the top. Martin Luther was there going up the staircase on his knees when suddenly, he says, he heard a verse of the scriptures in his mind. Romans 1 verse 16 or 17, I forget exactly which one it is. He heard the verse in his mind, but the just shall live by what? His faith. Martin Luther never made it to the top, the top of that staircase. Whether he got a third of the way up or halfway up, we're not quite sure. But he made his way up there somewhat and, and he heard that verse in his mind, the just shall live by faith, faith, sorry. And he got up from his, his knees, turned around and walked away. This was another turning point in his life. Finding the Bible at the wall was one. Meeting Dr. Staupitz was another. On this staircase, hearing the words, the just shall live by faith, was another turning point in his life that would put him on a trajectory that was far away from the one that he was currently living on and the one that the average monk or priest went on. He would go back to Wittenberg. This is the church there in Wittenberg. And as he got back to Wittenberg, another controversy would brew. Some of you may be familiar with it. As he's there in Wittenberg... Another man starts to come through town. His name was Johann Tetzel. Now, Johann Tetzel was from the area of Germany that he was, and he was commissioned by the church to sell indulgences. Now, we'll explain what indulgences are in a minute. He was commissioned to sell indulgences. And so he comes through town selling indulgences. Now, what is an indulgence? I'll put on the screen trying to explain a little bit what an indulgence is. They were linked to justification by their connection to the sacrament of penance. Now, a Catholic believed there was two wings to justification. Justification is a fancy word of talking about how we're saved. So the first wing is the sacrament of baptism. And that happens when? When you're born. So we can kind of assume that that takes place. The second one was the sacrament of penance. So everyone's got the baptism. Now you've got the penance. And what's penance? Penance is broken down into three things. You have contrition. Showing contrition for your sin. You have confession. Confessing your sins. Then you have satisfaction. And indulgences were connected to the act of satisfaction. Meaning it's not until you've shown contrition, it's not until you have confessed, and it's not until you have done satisfaction or indulgences, only then after doing all three are you justified. Justified. Now, we're going to look at in a few moments how this is different to what we believe. So Johann Tetzel comes through. Now, there was an economic crisis in the area, and the church was being a bit corrupt at the time. And so to simplify things very simply, what they would do, people would come and pay their indulgences. So an indulgence was something you would pay. Let's just go back a slide. So this act of satisfaction, you could go to the priest, and you could say, hey, I've sinned. And they'd be like, okay, I don't know, 100 bucks. 100 bucks. Forgiven. But not only could you do it for yourself, you could also do it for a relative who'd passed away. So let's say there's a relative who's died, and, and let's just say that they haven't, you know, they actually didn't confess this, or they didn't 
show satisfaction for their sin, you could on their behalf put money in for them. Therefore, you can release your dead relative from the state of purgatory and send them up to heaven. Now, there was financial problems going on. There was a financial crisis, economic problems, and it affected both the Vatican and the Prince Albert of the area of Germany. And it prompted this indulgence corruption. It was finally decided that when the indulgences should be promulgated on behalf of St. Peter's, St. Peter's was built from these indulgences, that half the proceeds would go to Rome, and there was also some of the families would get the other half of the proceeds. Corruption at the highest level. How common was this? Saxony, the area of Germany there, had collected almost 18,000 relics, ranging from a twig from Moses' burning bush to a tear that Jesus shed when he wept over Jerusalem. Money from this traffic in relics provided, what did it provide? The what? The endowment from the university of where? Wittenberg. Where did Martin Luther work? He worked for the university in where? So think about this. When Martin Luther started preaching against all these things, he was preaching against the fund that was funding his own university. You could use the phrase, don't bite the hand that what? Feeds you. Pilgrims came from miles around, for by making the proper prayers and offering, one could earn indulgences, which would cancel out almost two million years in purgatory. So this is the situation. They've got all types of crazy stuff you can pay to go and see. A twig, a tear. And now they're coming through offering indulgences, corruption, where they're selling it and they're splitting the money. Martin Luther sees what's going on. This is one of the famous phrases from Johann Tetzel. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And they still have some of these original... Um, boxes today where they collect the money as soon as that coin hits the bottom of there and you hear the, the, the ring ding your relative has been sprung from purgatory which is kind of a middle state and has gone now to heaven that's kind of the famous phrase but no, 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 notice this phrase here you should know Imagine hearing the preacher say this in his appeal. You should know whoever has confessed in his contract and put arms in the box, as his confessor counsels him, will have all of his sins forgiven. So why are you standing about idly? Run, all of you, for the salvation of your souls. Do you not hear the voices of your dead parents and other people screaming and saying, have pity on me, have pity on me. We are suffering severe punishment and pain from which you could rescue us. This is Johann Tetzel preaching to the crowd. And the end result was, come and pay your indulgences afterwards. Now, this type of facade of Christianity does not represent Jesus. Amen? It does not represent what the Bible says about confession and forgiveness. It does not represent what Jesus uh, is and who he is, a God of love. It doesn't represent that. But this was what was being preached to the masses. And when Martin Luther saw this, he rose up against it. And so, he wrote... A series of doctrinal statements or they are called the 95 thesis and he posted them to this door it wasn't exactly this door it would have been a door in this doorway the wooden door has gone now and today they have a, um, a metal door and they've etched onto the metal door all of the 95 theses written out he would have posted it here some say he nailed it. Others say, well, he actually used a, a blob of candle wax and he would have put a wax on there. We're not quite exactly sure what he did. He posted it on the door. Now, here's an interesting, an interesting point that I find very interesting personally. Soon after that, he would preach a scathing sermon on the just shall live by faith in this sermon, which was just down the road from the church. But a kind of a, a little known fact, maybe, we always talk about Martin Luther as being the one who did the Reformation. We always talk about Martin Luther as being this pillar and this bulwark of change, uh, you know, confronting the corrupt state of the church. I don't think Martin Luther ever intended to be a reformer. I don't think Martin Luther woke up in the morning and was like, you know what, I feel like taking on the whole church. I don't think so. It was never Martin Luther's goal to be the most famous German who's ever lived. 
It was never Martin Luther's goal to be the biggest preacher in the country of Germany. It was never his goal to be the most famous man alive in his generation and generations to come. It was never his goal to do that. And one of the reasons why I think we know that is, is because of the language he posted his 95 Theses in. He never wrote his 95 Theses in German. He wrote his 95 Theses in Latin. Meaning he was intending that his 95 theses would be a theological discussion between the professors at the university. Well, someone took that 95 theses in Latin, translated it into German, and because the Gutenberg press had been invented about 50 or 60 years previous, they started to rattle off the copies of Martin Luther's 95 theses and spread it all over the country. He never intended for this. In fact, he says, the publicity did not appeal to me. That was never his goal. It was never his intention. He, he posted it up there in Latin trying to spark a debate amongst his colleagues. But one thing led to another. You know, sometimes you may have a plan, but God has a bigger plan than what you have. And he just wanted to kind of discuss with his colleagues. But God was like, no, this is not a discussion for you and your colleagues. This is truth that's going to go to the country of Germany. And by default, it's going to go around the world after that. Praise the Lord for the Gutenberg Press. Amen. I mean, today we don't, I think, I think the modern equivalent of the Gutenberg press is the internet. That has transformed and changed the way that we as a people living on planet earth communicate one to another. It's changed it completely. And I'm glad to see as a church you are embracing technology, amen. Because it's one of the ways the world changes. Anyway. After Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses, the Pope wasn't too happy. So he wrote a letter, Exerge Domine, against him, declaring Luther to be a wild boar in the vineyard of Christ. It condemned him as a heretic and gave him 60 days to repent. It exhorted everyone to reject his teachings. And on the 10th of December, 1520, when the grace period was up, Martin Luther, he had a little bit of, um, what should I say? <laughs> he had a little bit of drama in himself too. He could rise to the occasion. He took the very bill or bull that the Pope had written against him. He walked out into a crowd where there was a crowd gathered around him and he set fire to it. Yeah, we didn't just like screw up and throw it in the bin. He's like, nah, let me make a bit of a scene. Allegedly, allegedly, it was under this tree. I say allegedly because I don't think the tree's that old. It was probably a tree on that spot or around in that area where he was under the tree and burned the papal bull. So by now he's kind of outcast from the church. They're not too fond of him, not too happy with him. And so the issue was about indulgences. It was about grace. It was about faith. It was about how we're saved. And have you ever heard the phrase, he, do, he who defines the term wins the argument? Anytime you're having a discussion with someone and you're arguing about a particular point, sometimes it's good to just pause and ask the person to define the phrase that you're arguing about. And you may realize that what they're arguing and what you're saying is two completely different things. And maybe you actually agree on what they're saying and they agree on what you're saying, but you think you're talking about the same thing. So Martin Luther, grace. Rome declared, as I mentioned earlier, there was two ways where you're justified. Number one, baptism. Number two, penance. And therefore, you need both of these in order to be justified. What do we believe as Protestants? Do we need both of these things, yes or no? Don't be so unsure about what you believe, church. Mm -mm. It's not through these sacraments that we receive justification. Amen? Amen. It's not through these sacraments we receive justification. The reformer spoke about justification by faith. And then the key word is alone. They said we're justified by our faith in God, only our faith in God. Just that. That's how we're justified. The idea was that faith rather than the sacraments is the instrument by which we're linked to Christ and receive the grace of justification. Faith is what connects us with God. It's how we receive his grace. It's how we receive forgiveness. It's by faith that we claim the promises of God. And the Bible says it's by the promises that we become a partaker of the divine nature. 
Martin Luther and the reformers insisted that the righteousness that we're justified by is a righteousness, so the technical term is institia extra nos. Basically, it means a righteousness separate from you. You can't generate this righteousness. You can't create this righteousness. You can't produce this righteousness. This righteousness is external to you. It's given to you. It's a gift, as the Bible mentions in other parts of the Bible. Romans 1.17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. The Bible also says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is what? It is a gift from God that he gives and doesn't ask for anything in return. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not seen. This righteousness, we don't produce ourselves. It comes outside us and is given to us by God. Now for Rome, the righteousness of Christ is not imputed or rather not given to the believer. What is it given? It's infused. Well, what's the difference between imputed and infused? Well, imputed is given. Infused is something that by slowly working in cooperation with God, you slowly receive it. When the believer cooperates with the infused righteousness, the believer then possesses inherent righteousness. Do we cooperate with God? We do. But do we cooperate with God to receive righteousness? He who defines the terms. We cooperate with Christ. Not in order to get something, but we cooperate with Christ after we've already received. Big difference. So Martin Luther, throughout the rest of his ministry, he would be elaborating on these themes. He would be tested on these themes. This statue here, or this monument here, is a Reformation monument from the city of Worms, or Worms, as, you, as it reads in English. And it was here where he was called before the Diet of Worms. And there he had to answer for his faith, defending these very principles that may seem like they're minutia, but they're not. They, they have huge, huge consequ consequences. Standing here on this rock, this slab was where he stood, where he gave that famous speech. Here I what? Stand. I can do no other. He made that statement after he just defended his teachings and saying that he must stand with the Bible and his conscience. And it doesn't matter what the church councils say. And then he said, here I stand. I can do no other. Defending these ideas, he spent time in a cave locked up, not in a cave, sorry, in a castle locked up there in Warburg. Why? Because the church did not like his views on justification, sanctification, grace, and faith. They didn't like it. It was enough what he was believing and going against the church. They would have ended his life if he continued living. And so some of his friends engineered for him to get captured and taken to this castle. See, the church was fine-tuning as well what they were saying about grace and faith. And this is the Council of Trent, which are the few around about that time. And they said, those who through sin have forfeited the grace of justification can again be justified when moved by God, they exert themselves to obtain through the sacrament of penance the recovery by the merits of Christ for the grace lost. Now, that's very complicated. Basically, they're saying that you can get forgiveness, or sorry, you can get justification when you complete what? Penance. And penance was what? Contrition, confession, and what? Satisfaction. And satisfaction is another word for what? Also was indulgences. And it's only after all three of those things do you receive justification. Now, what about when the Bible talks about today, in Matthew 3 verse 8, the Bible talks about fruits of what? Repentance. So in the Catholic Church, they talk about you're going to have contrition, confession, and what? Satisfaction, and then you are justified. Now, I don't believe that's true, but I'm throwing this out there. What about the text in the Bible that says you have to bring fruits, meat for repentance? Repentance. 
Let me ask you a question. Pastor Lloyd Grollemond. Now I'm going to pick on Andy instead. Andy Hunter's sitting there. He's got a nice phone in his hand. And let's just say he leaves it lying on the chair there and runs to the back. And then I come down from the end of Sabbath school and I see his phone on the chair. So I take his phone and put it in my pocket. And give him some freedom for a few minutes. <laughs> then, let's say during divine service, I'm convicted that I stole Andy's phone. So I say, Lord, forgive me, for I have sinned. Question. As I say that prayer, am I forgiven, yes or no? But I still have the phone. Am I forgiven, yes or no? Now, we struggle with this as Adventists. We struggle with this. We struggle with this. I believe at that moment when I say my prayer, I am what? Forgiven. The Lord forgives me as I pray. However, however, you see, repentance without genuine, without contrition is not genuine repentance. Now, the key point, true forgiveness brings, sorry, true repentance brings forgiveness before what? Restitution is made. Now, some of us as Christians today, we don't operate according to the Bible. We operate according to some counsels in years gone by. If someone wrongs us and asks for forgiveness, we're like, yeah, well, let me see how you act over the next two months before I decide if I forgive you. Is that true? That's how a lot of us act. We want to watch the person for six months to determine if they're worthy of our forgiveness. What if God treated us like that? What if God treated us like, we don't serve a God that's like, I'm just going to watch you now. You've sinned. I'm going to see if you come to church for the next six months first. And if you do come to church and Sabbath school, I'll forgive you. We don't serve a God like that, amen? Forgiveness is given before restitution is made. Restitution satisfies the command of God to pay our human debts. But this is the key thing. It is not the ground of justification. Point is, we're forgiven when we ask God. Then we have to go and repay our human debts and make wrongs right, as Jesus advised Zacchaeus to do so. But that is not the ground of being justified by God. Now, it's a big difference. It's a huge difference. Notice this quotation here. For Rome, grace makes human merit possible. Why? Because it's as you receive grace from God and you're working that you then... Your human merit is worth something. For the reformers, grace makes what you do as a human impossible. Huge difference. Huge, huge, huge difference. Martin Luther said this. This is what was going on in the time. These arguments of the scholastics about the merit of congruence and of worthiness are nothing but vain figments and dreamy speculations of idle folk about worthless stuff. Yet they form the foundation of the papacy, he said, and on them it rests to this very day. For this is what every monk imagines. This is what they imagine. This is what they think. This is what they think. By observing the sacred rules of my order, I can earn the grace of congruence, but by the works I do after I've received this grace, I can accumulate enough merit for myself and give some extra to other people as well. If I can work hard enough, I can be good enough in the eyes of God, and I'll be so good, I can bless other people with my goodness. But maybe not just bless them, sell it. Make a bit of money. There is no such thing as merit. All who are justified are justified for what? Nothing. And this is credited to no one but to the grace of God. For Christ alone it is proper to help and to save others with his merits and works. The works of others are of benefit to no one, not to themselves either. For the statement stands, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by what? Faith. See, the Catholic view is this. Faith plus your works, satisfaction, contrition, confession, satisfaction. Faith plus your works leads to you, sorry the arrow is not in the right place, leads to you being what? Justified. The reformers' view was your faith leads to you being justified 
And then after you are justified, your works will what? Follow. For one group, works were a precondition of receiving justification. For another group, your works were a fruit of you being what? Justified. Today, church, do you see your works and what you do as being a precondition or a fruit? I pray it's a fruit. But this struggle that Martin Luther and the Reformers 500 years ago struggled with is still something as a Christian world, as an Adventist church, we grapple with and we struggle with today as well. Is it precondition or is it fruit? It's a fruit, amen? It's a fruit. For Rome, justification rests on sanctification. Sanctification is the way you live your life on a daily basis. So your justification, being saved, is dependent on how you live. So if you can prove over six days that you've lived right, on the seventh day, you're justified. Mm -mm. Other way around, according to the Bible, that when you are saved by God, then flowing out from that is a life that represents the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and living at peace with all men. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace have you been what? Saved through what? Faith. And not of yourself, it is the what? gift of God and then he goes on and makes it clear not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ for the purpose or unto good works friends I pray that salvation is something that you see as a gift from God it's not something we can work or earn or try to achieve. It's something that Christ wants to give to us as a gift, freely. That forgiveness is given to us as a gift, freely. That it's not a precondition. Sorry, that our works are not a precondition. But they are merely a fruit of receiving the gift of that Christ gives us his righteousness. I pray that may be our experience. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we pause to thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of opening your word and seeing the pages of scripture, knowing that there is freedom, there is peace, there is joy in the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for men in the past like Martin Luther who, who peeled back the layers of darkness. And Lord, I pray you'd be with us today, that in our spiritual lives, you'd peel back whatever darkness may be there, that we can see the beauty of your character. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.